Look, if I'm talking to you, you shouldn't be gawping in thin air. You're so selfish, but what about us as in pair? I needed you to come over, man. I needed you to be near. I'm about to do something crazy. You'll regret okay, so we're interested still in quantum state learning problems. And the picture is that we have... You know, a bunch of copies and copies of some quantum die or quantum mixed state, which has probabilities P1 through PD and associated uh, orthonormal basis U1 through UD. These are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the state. We're not going to talk about the eigenvectors still just yet. Um, for this learning problem, we saw that, you know, the best idea is to measure n copies with this Shervile measure, which returns you a Young diagram lambda that has n boxes and at most d rows. The probability of seeing a particular Young diagram lambda has this rather complicated looking formula from representation theory. But we saw last time uh, some kind of combinatorial algorithm with a randomized input, this Pokemon dynamics, or RSK dynamics, as it's really called, uh, which gives like a different way to generate uh, Young Diagrams Lambda with the same distribution. And so it'll be fruitful to study this uh, perspective on this uh, Young Diagram generation method. So what can we say about it? So let's assume without loss of generality uh, that the probabilities are ordered. P1 is the biggest and PD is the smallest. And let lambda be drawn from this distribution. And last time we saw some examples suggesting that if the number of uh, dice or the number of boxes n is very large, that uh, lambda j seemed to be in the neighborhood of pj times n. And therefore, if you set p hat j to be lambda j divided by n, this could give a good estimate for pj. And therefore, we asked, is it true that, you know, in the limit as n goes to infinity, this quantity p hat, this vector, in fact, of uh, estimates p hat, tends to the vector of true probabilities p. And as mentioned last time, we said that Vershik and Karov proved in 1981 that the answer is yes. Now, this is just a limiting statement, and it's kind of like a law of large numbers for the row lengths of this random Young diagram. And a more refined thing to ask about would be whether there's, in fact, a central limit theorem. This question was studied uh, way back in 1988 by physicists Alitsky, Rudnitsky, and Sadowski. They were motivated by a topic known as quantum superradiance, and they proved this very impressive looking uh, central limit theorem. So let's assume that P1 is greater than P2 is greater than dot 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 PD, and let lambda be this uh, random Young diagram. So they said, let's look at lambda 1 minus P1n. This is kind of the neighborhood we expect lambda 1 to be in, and we'll normalize by root n. And simultaneously look at this for lambda 2 and lambda 3 up to lambda d, in general looking at lambda j minus pjn over root n. And they show that as n goes to infinity, this vector of d numbers tends to a Gaussian distribution, a multivariate Gaussian distribution uh, with mean 0, and covariance matrix sigma given by this matrix here uh, with some formulas involving the, the pi's. Now, uh, what I'd really only like you to note about this theorem statement is this is literally exactly the same central limit theorem you get for the basic multinomial distribution. What is the multinomial distribution? Well, just imagine, you know, going back to the Pokemon process, you draw, you know, cards, C, uh, randomly according to the probability distribution, P. So you just draw N cards where the ith card uh, is rank I with probability PI. And rather than plugging them into this, you know, funny Pokemon process, this RSK process, just do the natural thing of counting up the frequencies and let H be the histogram of, sorry, let F be the histogram of frequencies. Then uh, this is the F's, you know, row lengths are distributed according to the multinomial distribution. And it's very, very ancient that a central limit theorem holds for this. And the central limit theorem that in fact holds is exactly the same central limit theorem. Okay, so then you might think, wow, everything is really the same. I mean, I guess the distribution of the row lengths of this, this lambda, this Young diagram, is pretty much the same as that of just the basic histogram. So maybe we can prove everything we possibly want to prove using very ancient statistics results. Well, that turns out to be not quite correct. Uh, <clears throat> so for example, uh, if you just draw like a random you know, word like this with these as the uh, with uh, probabilities p1 through pd and get a random string of uh, symbols between 1 and d of length n, and you let f be the histogram of frequencies, you can try to use this to estimate the vector of probabilities p by, again, letting p hat just be the normalized frequencies, f over n. And then it's not very hard to show um, that this is a very good estimator of p. The L1 difference between p and p hat, the sum of the absolute values of the errors, 
is bounded by a constant time square root d over square root n with high probability. Okay, and so if you want this error to be small, it suffices for n to be on the order of d in order to get a you know, very good estimate of all the probabilities p1 through pd. So that's the classical situation. Now, what about the quantum situation? Uh, let's take the same you know, sequence of cards, put it through this Pokemon process or RSK process and uh, get out a Young diagram lambda. So this is a different way of getting a sorted or a histogram, a sorted histogram, a Young diagram lambda. And you can try to do the same thing, let p hat be lambda normalized by n and hope that p hat is a good uh, estimator for p as vectors. Well, it was shown in a sequence of works um, that the error bound you get here with high probability is proportional to d over root n, not root d over root n. And that's kind of a drag because it means if you want this you know, error to be small, then n will have to be proportional to d squared, quadratically worse than the d here. Moreover, you know, this is not just some poor analysis. Uh, it was shown in 2015, building on some works of Bianne and Melio, that this is the strongest you know, statement that's true about this estimator p hat. It really does need this method of taking the Young diagram and dividing the row lengths by n and using that as your estimate of the p's for the unknown quantum die really does require uh, d squared samples to do well. And that's really a drag, actually. Um, you know, if you've got a quantum experiment and the dimension is 100, you know, there's a big difference between, you know, around 100 samples to estimate it versus 10,000 samples to estimate the probabilities. And I say this is funny because it shows there's like quite a noticeable difference between this classical situation where f is the histogram of frequencies and the quantum situation where lambda is this uh, result of the RSK process, yet the two objects have the exact same central limit theorem. So it almost seems uh, contradictory, uh, but it just really goes to show that you know, a central limit theorem, although it looks very uh, precise, does not give you as much information as you really need to understand uh, a statistics problem. So to dig into that a little bit deeper or to explain it a bit better, you know, what does the central limit theorem statement actually imply? Remember, we do know that you know, p hat, the, the limit of this vector of p's, sorry, the limit of the vector of lambda is divided by n tends to the vector of p's as n goes to infinity. So that's a statement about a limit. So I can uh, break it down into the, you know, the epsilons and deltas. What it really shows is the following. For every you know, small epsilon, there exists some n zero such that you, know, you have some closeness measure of the estimates provided n is bigger than or equal to n zero. So for example, p hat one is pretty close to p1, the error being epsilon over root n, or the whole vector is close in L1 norm, the error being epsilon over root n, you know, provided n is big enough as a function of n0. Uh, but here's the catch. This n0 may well depend, for example, on d, you know, the number of faces of the die. In fact, you can prove that it must depend on it. So although it goes to infinity, or, you know, the, the error gets small as n goes to infinity, uh, the rate at which it goes to infinity plays a big role, potentially. For example, uh, the following statement might well be true, uh, that the expected value of this L1 error is at most root d over root n plus, let's say, I don't know, d cubed over n. So that kind of statement is completely consistent with the central limit theorem. But you see, if this statement happens to be true, then you don't have a small error unless n is much bigger than d cubed, okay? which would even be worse than the d squared we talked about on the last uh, slide. Moreover, it's not just that this n0 might depend on d, but it might depend on something even uh, less obvious. Let's say the size of the gap between two consecutive p's. It might depend on, let's say, 1 over p1 minus p2. In fact, this also is true. It does depend on this. Uh, for example, it's Tracy and Widom uh, in 2001 did a sort of a more refined study of the central limit theorem and showed that the expected value of lambda 1, the number of boxes in the first row, it's close to p1 times n. Um, so in particular, if you divide both of these quantities by n, then the estimate for p1, p hat 1, is close to p1. But the, there's an additive term that looks like this funny expression. And you see it has p1 minus p2 in the denominator. So if p1 is really close to p2, then this term blows up. As I mentioned, this is not, uh, you know, an artifact of the proof or a coincidence or anything. This is a real phenomenon. Uh, if you remember this Alitsky, Rudnitsky, Sadowski result, I kind of slipped past you the fact that these p's have to be not equal to each other. This is only true if 
P1 is strictly bigger than P2, is strictly bigger than P3, and so forth. And in fact, this central limit theorem is false if any two P's are equal to each other. And Alitsky, Runitsky, and Sadowski knew this fact. And indeed, like champions, they worked out uh, each different central limit theorem that's true depending on like which P's equal each other. So if the first T1 P's are equal, and then the next T2 P P's are you know, also equal, but smaller than the first T1, and then you have another batch that are all equal, and then another smaller batch that are all equal, and so forth. For each different one of these situations, they worked out like the different central limit theorem that you get for this uh, distribution coming from the RSK process or the Pokemon process. And if you look at their paper, it's uh, these different scenarios, except in this case where they're all distinct, look like a bit of a mess. But it turns out that the answer is not that messy. Uh, to explain, uh, let me mention another paper by Johansson from 2001, extending Tracy and Whittam's work. Uh, they considered like the, you know, the most uh, non-distinct case, the case where all the p's are equal, okay, where the probability of sphere quantum die are all one over d. It's like the uniform distribution over the orthogonal basis vectors. They looked at the resulting Young diagram lambda u get in that case. So in this case, we kind of expect all the row lengths to be around uh, n over d. And they showed that if you, you know, take the row length, subtract n over d, and normalize in this way by dividing by square root n over d, this uh, vector of d quantities tends in the limit as n goes to infinity to the spectrum of a traceless d by d uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble matrix. So basically a, a random matrix of Gaussians conditioned on having a zero trace. So that's actually like a different, you know, limiting theorem that's quite beautiful in the case where all the p's are the same. Uh, furthermore, you know, the this spectrum is pretty well understood itself. Uh, in fact, it's known that as d tends to infinity, this vector of d numbers tends to uh, square root d times the semicircle law, the famous semicircle law, supported on the interval from minus 2 to 2. And as a consequence of that, uh, Johansson was able to show that the expected value of the number of boxes in the first row, lambda 1, uh, is at most n over d plus, well, something that's uh, asymptotically 2 times root n. At least this is true uh, for any epsilon for sufficiently large n. Uh, in the other direction, by the way, it's not hard to show using Green's theorem, I'll call it an exercise, that the expected value of lambda 1 is at least the probability, the largest probability, the p max times d which in this case where all the p's are the same is uh, uh, n over d. Sorry, this should say p max times n, not p max times d. So uh, this is the case when all the p's are the same. Uh, in general, you can, as I said, get like a nice uh, understanding of this limiting distribution uh, for any situation when some of the p's are the same, some of the p's are different. Uh, if you look at the Sue's PhD thesis from 2008, uh, sort of clarifying the Alitsky, Rudnitsky, Sadowski result, uh, he gave the exact central limit theorem for a general uh, list of probabilities, P1 through PD, and it's a direct sum of certain different traceless GUD, GUEs. Um, it's not too hard to write down, but I haven't put it up here on the screen because it wouldn't be particularly enlightening, I don't think. Okay. Now, again, this statement here in the interesting case where all the p's are the same uh, gives you an upper bound on the expected value of lambda 1, but it's only like a limiting statement. And therefore, as mentioned, it's not useful for concrete estimation bounds because we don't know, you know, you know the rate at which this limit occurs. Perhaps it depends on how n large n is compared to d. Uh, so for actual concrete estimation bounds for statistics problems, we need non-asymptotic results. For example, this would be a great result to have. Um, if this were just literally true, no asymptotics for every value of n and every value of d. In fact, this is true. That's a theorem I proved with John Wright in 2016. And another way to state this result is as follows. This is equivalent by Green's theorem. If you take a uniformly random string of numbers of length n, where each number is uniformly chosen uh, between 1 and d, and you look at the length of the longest increasing subsequence in it, or non-decreasing subsequence, the expected value of that length is at most n over d plus 2 times root n. And remember, if you just take the most common element in the string, that will, in expectation, well, in fact, always be at least uh, n over d. 
and therefore the expected longest increasing subsequence is at least n over d. So this gives like a concrete upper bound, you know, plus two times root n for the expected value of this longest increasing subsequence. Now, uh, what's kind of nice about this is since it, you know, literally holds for every n and every d, you can take the limit in the opposite way. You can fix n and let d tend to infinity. And when you do that, this turns into an interesting result. Uh, so let's think about that. Fix n and now fix, uh, let d go to infinity so that the, the number of symbols in your string is extremely large compared to n. And therefore, when you choose the random string, with very high probability, all the symbols will be different. And since this uh, Pokemon process or the longest increasing subsequence uh, information only depends on the relative rankings of the, these numbers between 1 and d, it's really just as though you've chosen a uniformly random permutation of length n, call that pi. And the study of you know, the longest increasing subsequence in a uniformly random permutation is uh, quite interesting and has a somewhat long history. Uh, the resulting lambda you get in this case is uh, drawn from what's called the Plancherel distribution. It has a somewhat simpler representation theory formula for its probabilities. Uh, but in particular, as d goes to infinity, you know, this term n divided by d goes to zero and only the two root n remains. And we get as a corollary that if you take a uniformly random permutation of length n, then the length of the longest increasing subsequence in it has expectation, which is at most two times root n. That holds for every n. And this is one side of the known results about the famous hammersley ulam problem of the longest increasing subsequences in random permutations. So this corollary here, uh, that the LIS is at most two root n in expectation, was first proven uh, by Vershik and Karov, in fact, in 1985, and independently by Pilpel in 1990. And it can be compared with the well-known asymptotic results about the length of the longest increasing subsequence in a Plancherel distributed lambda, which was resolved uh, by Logan and Shep and Vershik and Karov back in 77. They showed that the expected longest increasing subsequence length uh, over square root n tends in the limit as n goes to infinity to 2. Uh, but this gives a concrete you know, upper bound that is true for every value of n. So not only do we have uh, this theorem about the case when all the p's are equal and equal to 1 over d, but more generally, it was shown um, that a similar statement holds for every row. So for the kth row uh, and for general values of p1 through pd, it was shown that the expected value of lambda k, which by the way, you know, should be around pk times n, as we're planning to use lambda k over n as our estimator for pk, uh, it was shown that the uh, expected value of lambda k is within exactly two root n of pk times n for every k. And this is both a, an upper and lower bound on the difference. Actually, you can give a slightly stronger result in case pk happens to be smaller than one over d, uh, you can put in this extra factor of uh, square root d times p of pk. And in the next video, I'll talk about how this is proven using various combinatorial properties of the Pokemon process or the RSK process. Uh, but let me just conclude now by mentioning some applications of this statement. For one, you can use it to get very sharp bounds for estimating the eigenvalues, p of an unknown quantum state, rho, not just with respect to you know, the L1 norm, but with respect to much stricter norms like KL divergence or chi-squared divergence. And it was also used by Bavarian, Marabin, and Wright to get a very sample efficient estimator for the entropy of this probability distribution, which is known as the von Neumann entropy of the unknown quantum state.